Hey, here's a couple of things so I get to know you a little bit. Hey, does this sound familiar? Qualifications of a youth pastor. Courageous. Rigorous. Discipline. Unwavering devotion to Jesus. Psychologically strong. <laughs> Brains and expertise in everything they do. Hours of work. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Pay. Free. Does that sound familiar? Hey, just a quick so I get to kind of know you guys. How many have been in the ministry less than 5 years? Less than 5 years. A few of you. Perfect. How many less than 10? Less than 10. Less than 10. Perfect. Anybody over 10? A few of you. Excellent. Excellent. Well, hey, what we want to talk about tonight is, um, first, I want, first I want to tell you about me so you kind of know what I am. Ed kind of gave you an introduction, but uh, I like to always say, hey, I'm a sinner saved by grace, right? It took me a lot, a lot of years to understand that, what it means to be a sinner and to be saved by grace. Because I grew up, I grew up in a church, I church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meetings, I was there, mom and dad, great, but guess what? I was pretty legalistic because that was pretty doggone good. Pretty doggone good, man. I was a good kid, but man, it came to me. There's actually four moments in my life that changed, that stand out for me. Twelfth grade or um, seventh grade, twelve years old. How many know Bill Glass? Bill Glass, Bill Glass Crusade. He's like the uh, name of the offensive lineman today. He played for the Browns. He's a big offensive lineman. Shared his faith. Our church was hosting a crusade. Moncoff Stadium. I'm on the 50-yard line. Mom singing the choir. Remember, very legalistic. First time, I say, oh my goodness, it's a relationship. It's not how many times I go to church. It's not how good I am with mom and dad. It's a relationship. Oh, uh, I get it. Oh, did I live a perfect life after that? <laughs> no. So the next big moment of my life from that point, obviously growing, growing, and scripture calls it right, we're sanctified, the sanctification process. It takes a lifetime, right? The uh, next moment for me was uh, junior in college. Junior college made a decision, best decision ever made, go with Campus Crusade, Athletes in Action. Man, that was the next thing I realized, I realized, okay, it's just not about me. It's about how do I evangelize? How do I tell my friends? Up to that point, I had a great faith, but guess what? It was mine. Then obviously went through uh, that great summer, grew my faith tremendously. Next moment, another great moment is I got a, I got a beautiful wife, Jody, who is just a saint who puts up with me. We got married. And man, Mary started teaching me about the next step of faith and what it really means. The next moment actually came about 12 years ago, and Ed mentioned it. Um, moved from Tennessee, my wife and I moved around 10 times, lived in a lot of places. Because of that, my kids have attachment issues, just so you know. I'm paying for therapy the rest of their life. <laughs> but we moved around a lot. We moved back to Cleveland, Ohio. We're in Cleveland, Ohio. A guy by the name of Brad's Decrete. You guys know Brad? Yeah, yeah. yeah we ended up at his church. I, I didn't know what to... Fellowship of Grace Brethren Churches was. Oh, wait, we just changed our name, right? <laughs> I didn't know what that was. I went to Bible believing evangelical churches. I went to this one church, met a guy called Brad Dees Creek in the youth ministry, and he said, Hey, we're going to go to Urban Hope on a trip. I said, Urban Hope, what the heck's that? We go to Urban Hope. Remember, I'm a 43 year old old man, right? At the time, tells you how much older I am now. I'm standing on the corner, literally, I'm standing on the corner, and Ed knows the story. Actually, I met a homeless guy. They actually tried to partner with for about three years. We maintained a relationship. But in that moment, I'm standing there. I'm on the corner sidewalk, and I'm looking. I'm saying, I get it, because I was on church boards. I was leading youth. I was doing all kind of great things, but I get it. It is about giving and serving your kingdom, right? And so it changed my life. Changed my life such that, as I said, nine years, would have been 10 years this year. Taking teams out of Philadelphia, take 45, 50 kids every year. Uh, my lovely wife would go to Momentum uh, with uh, the kids from the um, church and just a great relationship. Ed asked me about four or five years ago, hey, Joey, you get on the board. Actually, Ed doesn't tell the whole story, actually. To tell you how profound and responsive thought, I'm sitting in his office, he tells me, what did I do? Do you remember? I don't know if you're... You were going to pray about it. We pray about it. See, he doesn't remember because I... Actually, I wept. I wept because I was so overwhelmed with the burden of I take things very serious in life, right? And you'll hear about this. But man, the burden of, wow, Lord, you want me to do this? What does that mean for your kingdom? Right? So on the board of CE, because why? I am passionate about 
youth and passionate about the next generation. That's where it's going. Ministries, Ed said, I've been discipling uh, 23 young men since seventh grade on Sunday nights. They're now juniors in high school. We've got one more year to go. We'll see if I can make it out that long. And also on Fridays, I have a men's group that has met for about nine years. So very involved in my faith because as we talk about, right, you've you got to be engaged and involved. Okay? Hey, let me ask you, how, how many are actually paid by the church to do your work that are here? Yeah. How many are here that are actually volunteers? Or how many are the significant other of the one that gets paid that got sucked into it? Okay. Hey, just remember, everything we talk about, please take in the frame of reference because sometimes in the business world, and I say this all the time, in the business world, we do things, mm, sometimes uh, we demand a lot. And so sometimes grace and mercy gets lost out of the business world. So please take everything I talk about to, hey, I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I'm just trying to present, again, how I've seen the business world. Hey, in the business world, um, again, I say so you get a, uh, a frame of mind. I've had the pleasure, if you want to call it a pleasure, I've, I've got 1.5 million miles on United Airlines. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm a million mile. Uh, it's not so good. Ask my kids. I mean, dad wasn't around a lot, right? Uh, I've had the privilege of being in 35, over 35 different countries around the world. Uh, that company that I was with, uh, we had 21 locations around the world, uh, over 5,000 employees. So I've had some experiences that God has given me to kind of open my eyes to, again, leadership, setting goals, and being driven by that. So we're going to walk through that tonight. Here's what we're going to talk about. I'm talking about how do you set the tone to empower volunteers? Right? Because that's huge. Because I can tell you this. I said this to Brad Deescrew is here. And some of the people at dinner heard me say this. Brad and I, we partnered that first year. I looked at Brad and said, Brad, you're going to have a great youth group of about 50 to 75 kids. I didn't, it wasn't a slam against Brad. The point I was trying to make to him was, if you do it on your own, you're, you're only one person. I tell my organizations I work with, hey, Joel, Joel's a pretty arrogant guy. Just so you get to know me. I'm pretty self-confident in what I do. And I tell the team, hey, you don't want the company to be just as good as me. You, we want to be good as, in this company I'm at, we want to be good as a thousand people. Same for you guys in your ministry. You want to be as good as the volunteers that you bring in, and they're going to be looking at you. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about developing accountability of volunteers. One thing we'll talk about, and uh, I can give you some experience, accountability is the glue that holds things together. And you guys have seen this, because you work with youth, and when the parents don't hold the kids accountable, what's it like? Chaos, Right? Accountability is critical in organization and in life. And with that, how do you set smart goals? We'll talk about, we'll talk about, hey, are you a manager or a leader? What's the difference between managing and leading? Leadership and management. Give you an idea of what that difference is. And then we'll talk about some fatal mistakes that we make. Okay? Take a look at that. That was Noah. Hey, can we have some volunteers to stay and help clean up? Right? It's been a problem from the beginning, right? Getting the volunteers. Who wanted to clean up after how many animals were on that thing? Not a lot, right? So as a leader, when you think of volunteers, what do you think about? Do you think about all those nice things we have up there? Do you think about charity, thanks, they're helpful, they're unselfish, they're thoughtful? Or do you think about like, oh man, why can't they show up on time? Why can't they do what they say they're going to do? Man, where are my volunteers? Right? Uh, that's what I've experienced leading youth ministry is where are the volunteers? It's not always pretty. Now, we have some great volunteers that are there all the time that come, but then the majority of them, and I'll talk about the bell curve of personality, the majority of people aren't there. Okay? So it's a challenge. So here's setting the tone to empower a volunteer. Three things. One, starts with you. What's your foundation? Two, What's the expectations that you have for the organization or for your ministry or for the youth program? And last one is leadership. How do you empower volunteers? What's your foundation? This is the first thing I've learned. Again, over a lot of years, I've learned I used to basically in my walk, in my faith, I used to simply drift through life. I mean, I could say that now. When you're looking at me back then, if someone probably said, oh, Joel, you're not drifting. But I didn't have a cognitive, conscious, man, here's what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I was going through the motions of checking the box of doing the things I thought I was supposed to do. Now, as I'm older, I look back and say, man, ah, my foundation, I really need to know where I am in my foundation. I talk to my kids all the time. 
If they'd hear right now, they'd flop down on the floor and say, Dad's going to say, where are you spiritually, where are you emotionally, where are you physically? Right? Those aspects of your life. And of course, your volunteers, they want to see and know that you're committed. That you're committed. Because if they see that you're not committed to what you're doing, guess what? They're not going to be committed. They're not going to be there. They got to see and know that, hey, I'm all in. Does that mean you're perfect? Heavens no. What they'll see is, man, you are driven to be who you need to be in the role you are. Your personal development never ends. You never arrive. I used to have this thought, if I worked hard enough and I did all the right things, I'd get to a point where I would just say, oh, it's done. I got it figured out. Right? What I realized is, of course, Scripture talks about this. Paul talks about running the race, right? It's a marathon all the way to the end until I get the prize. I used to think that, oh, man, I could just run and I'll get there and then life would be a coast. I got it figured out. Oh, nope. Every day is a different day. It never ends. So personal development, where are you? This is what I've created for myself, right? So this is a little chart that kind of depicts things I've learned through my business life and career. Three things on the far right side when it starts with is, hey, what's your passion and purpose? Now, as believers, we know what our passion and purpose is, right? We are designed and created to worship the one true God, and we're designed in that worship to bring other people to understand and know that, right? But for you, it has to be, I try to make it personal, what is that passion and purpose that makes you exist? For me, it was the three Fs. Now, here's anything you learned about me. Anybody that's ever worked with me, I can only remember three things. <laughs> So that's why everything's in threes. Because that's all I remember. That's all the brain power I had. So we had three. So it's the three S. Faith, family, friends. I looked at it and said, okay, my faith is the foundation of who I am. And then my family, my circle, and then my friends around me. Those are going to be my three Fs of my foundation of what I'm going to reach to. Then I'm going to say the three Ds. The three Ds for me were desire, discipline, dedication. I used to, a little side note. My son-in-law and daughter uh, live in Tennessee, and they teach in Tennessee, and I went into the uh, middle school where they teach, and they had a banner up that hung and said, the three Ds. I said, hey, I should get credit for that. <laughs> but desire, just some dedication, is look, desire, a wish for something. Everybody has a desire for something. In fact, man, how many kids do you know that have, have addiction problems, alcohol, drugs? Raise your hands. How many of you know, dealing with it? How many are dealing with what Bruce told us about? Sexual orientation, right? A lot of us, right? How many kids are dealing with divorced parents? Oh, holy cow. Everybody has a wish, a desire for something that God gave them that they're battling and looking for the solution in other ways, right? That desire then turns into a discipline. When I, may, when I say, here's what I'm going to do, then, okay, what's the discipline I have with it? That's a commitment to the task or the purpose. Then I'm going to stick with it. And then the dedication of keep falling out. Example I always use is, I hate to admit this, but, you know, I'm not, when I got married to my wife, she reminds me I'm not the same size. It's just, it's a fact of life, right? Different things, and it happens. And that's, again, it's just the example where I say because how you discipline yourself, how you dedicate yourself to various aspects of life, right? And so for me, it's just like, oh, how do you do that? For me, it was, as TK said earlier, I played baseball, and baseball was my desire, discipline, and dedication, right? I played it all the way through college, worked very hard, and had very much success at it. After that was over, and I didn't make it into the pros because you can see I'm only five foot nine on a good day with the heels on, right? <laughs> Versus being six foot two and muscles, I couldn't make it, I had to realize it, so I turned my passion into business, the business world. So that desire, discipline, dedication, the purpose of what drives you, and understanding in your world environment that you're operating in. Because that's a lot of times, some people, what they get confused about is they try to take what's going on and it's not even happening in this world environment that you're around. Your friends, family is do, looking at something totally different and you're bringing in a different set of rules into this arena. You gotta know the environment that you're operating in. I've learned that because again, in my career, I've worked for four different companies. Uh, just so you know, my background is finance and accounting. And as the leader of those companies and I, as I moved up, if I tried to take something specific from here and just put it over here, it wouldn't work. I could take the concept, what I call the guardrails of what we're doing, I could apply them, but in between there, it's going to look different. And I got to adjust that. That's that world environment. In how I accomplish it is the mission. How will you go about it? I call them the three S's and the three P's. People, process, products, right? I'm going to deal with people. I got to have a process that I well-defined. 
the products are what I'm offering, and then safe, smart, and selfless. And it all comes to the top. Vision is what you want to do with your existence. The vision, culture, and accountability of what you're trying to great, create in your organization is the key. And we're going to talk through that one as we go through this. So, expectations of the organization and volunteers. What does it take for an organization to perform at a high level and achieve excellence? That's the question, right? Because everybody, I don't know, anybody in here not want to be excellent? You want to be mediocre? It's okay. If you want to be mediocre, it's fine. Yeah. Right? Most people desire, right? Have that desire. They want to pursue excellence because why? Who put that in us? Man, Jesus put it in us, right? That's what he created us to be, is to pursue that so we have it. Where it breaks down then obviously is in that discipline and that dedication of how I'm going to pursue it and what that looks like in my life. So an organization of excellence. This in organization development are six characteristics of every organization <laughs> development out there. And this is where it starts to get a little technical in business, right? Only to set up of those six, I have relationships. Every organization has relationships, right? All of you have a boss. A senior pastor. All of you have, sometimes depending on the size of the church, other pa oh, worship pastor, uh, maybe another uh, uh, children's pastor. You definitely got volunteers to make it happen, right? So you have these relationships. There's a structure of how that works. It's been defined. There's a purpose of the organization, whatever that is defined as. There's mechanisms, and those are policies and procedures. And then you get rewarded. And in the world, sometimes the rewards are small or large, but there are rewards. Obviously, as a believer, and this is where our reward is, and I'm going to tell you guys this, right? I, I, I am so honored to be here with you guys today. I am. In fact, here's how I view you guys. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be behind you just watching and applauding you guys going in. Because you know all those hands you put up? Man, look what you guys do. You guys are shaping the next generation. And it frustrates me in this world Personally, I think the most important person in your church, and you guys would love to hear this, right, is you guys. Senior pastor on the pulpit, uh, good talker. <laughs> good talker. Worship, worship leaders, worship leaders, you know, can play the guitar, play the keyboard, can dance around. I can't dance around, right? But man, you guys are down in the muck of life, right? Because quite honestly, you raise your hands. If I sit in a room of adults and I said the same thing, how many people you know that have an addiction? How many adults raise your hand? Zzz. They'd shut off, right? Or how many are dealing with divorce, right? You kids are open and you're dealing with them and you're shaping the next generation. You guys have heard, and actually, TK will talk tomorrow, right, TK? On Generation Z, right? Personally, in my life, what I've seen, because now I've seen my grandpa, I've seen my dad, I've seen myself, I've seen my son, I'm starting to have grandchildren. Uh, TK will talk about this. This is why I'm passionate about the youth. You know the old adage, right? We're one generation away from the gospel being almost eliminated. And I've traveled around the world and I've seen where it's been extinguished, right? And so we have to be passionate about that to see, man, I'm going to rise up. And we have a generation now that is hungry and hurting and looking for answers. And you guys are the ones doing it. So, man, I applaud you. Applaud you guys for what you do. Okay? Key for the organization is leadership. And leadership is the key because you are the one that will drive the excellence in it. In an organization, here's another thing change is constant. Here's what I tell my team that works for me, right? Uh, I say, the first thing when I talk to them, I say, you know what? Here's one thing I can promise you I can't promise you good health, I can't promise you employment. I can't promise you your significant other, whether it be a wife or whoever likes you. Here's what I can promise you. Things are going to change. Things are going to change. Things change. And here's what's our reaction to the change. That's what will breed our success. How do I react to that? So one thing I promise an organization, things will change. Leadership is the cornerstone. Most important function is to make the organization success is to have a good leader. Have a leader, and again, we'll talk about, you don't have to be the top person to be the leader, right? There's leaders within the organization. In fact, if you want the top leader to do everything, I'll go back to my example. If you wanted me to do everything for our company of 1,000 employees, seven locations in North America, we would fail. And a good leader at the top would recognize, now I need the skill sets of everyone around me to get the job done. So singleness of mind and focus. 
organization exists to serve others, not ourselves. That's why God created the organization, the church, right? The foundation of what we do, even in business, organizations. I tell our team, we, we do not serve us. You don't come to work. I mean, you do to get a paycheck. But at the end of the day, that's not the end result, right? We have to serve somebody, even in the business world. In faith and in the church, right? We know it's not about ourselves. Okay, how many of your volunteers recognize that? Hmm. A lot of times, a lot of volunteers are more about themselves than they are about understanding the bigger picture. You as a leader, that's your job to work them to help them see that to raise to a different level. Because, hey, that was me. I, I can tell you, that was me. You wouldn't have seen it. But a lot of things of what I did for a lot of those years was I was doing some good things, but why was I doing it? So I look good, right? Doing it for me. So I look good versus, no, no, the organization has a greater purpose. And I didn't learn, I learned that more staying on that street at Urban Hope. In inner city of Philadelphia, I learned, oh man, Lord, it is about your organization, the church, to serve for your purposes. Data flows bottom up, information flows both ways, but decisions are top down. So in good leadership, so the next we can talk about there's three leadership styles and being a leader that I'll talk to you from the New Testament, right? Prophet, priest, king. And I'll tell you what those mean. Actually, in the business world, we call them something different. From my perspective, it's pretty neat what goes on in the business world. Oh, it's so rooted in the scripture when you look at it. No doubt about it. But what that means is, look, data, I always tell my team, data, data is useless if you just get data. You got to take data and turn it into information. Data comes from the bottom up, right? Hey, what kid is hurting? How are they hurting? That's data. Information, what do I do with it? Information flows both ways. I collect the data, I take the information, then I make a decision. Decisions and as a leader go this way. If you try to run an organization, even in the church, right? If you try to run it on a, everybody trying to get consensus, whew, you'll be in a meeting all night, right? At some point, right, as a leader and running that program, you have to say, hey, this is the direction we're going to go. After you've taken the data, you've taken all the information, input from everybody, you say, here's the direction we want to go. And we'll talk about the difference between being a leader and managing that as you go. Next thing is communication flow should be well-defined is critical to be understood. Meaning, the most things I've seen in business and even in the church is a lot of times people get sideways because why? Just misunderstandings. Misunderstandings because of our own insecurity. I hate to admit this, right? All of us in this room are pretty insecure, right? We like to be secure in who Christ is, but we, we battle that, right? Paul says it so well, Romans 7, right? Oh, I do, why do I do what I do, right? How do I fight that? Because spiritual versus the carnal, and that battle's going on. And so I struggle with that. And so we're all insecure. That insecurity, then a lot of times communication breaks down and we get into problems. In fact, anybody know how many denominations we have today? <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm going to answer, right? Why do we have so many denominations in the evangelical Christian faith? I'm not talking about world religions, just even in our faith. Because why? Communication, breakdown, interpretation, and getting away from the root cause of what Christ has called us to do. The goal of the organization is to increase cooperation and a sense of pride among the members of the organization that you have a purpose that you're here for. And you, again, if you're around me all day, one thing, I have, a, I have a picture in my office, and it has one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and it has a dog in each frame. And it goes like this, the dog is standing there, the dog is standing there, the dog is standing there, the dog is standing there. The dog is standing there, the dog is standing there, the dog is standing there, the dog is standing there. The dog is standing there, the dog is standing there, the dog is standing there, the dog is sitting. My point is, you gotta repeat that over and over and over. You gotta remind, sit dog, sit dog, sit dog, sit dog, sit dog, sit dog. Finally it gets it. Same thing with people, right? We gotta we gotta repeat over so they hear what that vision, passion is and what we're trying to convey because they forget it. So when someone comes to my office, and they, that's why I say, hey, you hurt? And here's how you know when as a leader you're being successful, when that dog is now saying back to you, sit, 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 sit. <laughs> right? That's where you want to get to as a leader so people understand where you're going uh, as an organization. Okay. Uh, leadership, leaders are the key in success of all those things. There's no doubt leadership is critical. It's actually, through the scriptures, having a leader. Now, again, does that mean leaders are perfect? 
Ha, was David perfect? Far from it, right? In fact, most of the leaders in the Bible were very unperfect, fallible men that failed. Women that failed, but what? Through grace, mercy, understanding that my position in Christ, but I'm called to be a leader. And all of us are called to be a leader in different ways. Everybody doesn't have the same skill sets, right? Absolutely not, right? We all have different skills, different abilities, but a leader recognizes his strengths, his weaknesses, and what he tries to do is put people around him to supplement that. In fact, sometimes, here's what a leader recognizes too, is sometimes I'm going to bring somebody close to me, they're probably going to be better than me, and they're going to pass me up. I'm going to pass the torch to them. And that's great because why? The kingdom just expanded. So vision, culture, and accountability, what I call VCA, you must stand for something or you will fall for everything. Have you guys seen that? Right? If you don't have clear foundation of who you are, this is a problem with young kids today, right? They're struggling to find who they are. They will then try everything under the sun. They'll be driven to see what could I do. And again, we have a society and a culture today encouraging them to do that, as Bruce talked earlier. But you got to stand for something. And again, as a leader, that's what the kids are looking at. They're looking at you saying, man, what do they stand for? What conviction, what vision, culture, and accountability are you creating around them? Example of these. Vision. I use CE National. And under one underneath that, I use the National Institute. So here's the vision. It's an imagined idea, a goal toward which one is aspiring to be. At CE, the mission statement has been, and again, when I have a mission statement, you should be able to say it in one sentence. I call it the stump speech in the elevator. Right? you got to be able to say it quickly and know what it is. For CE, we are a catalyst for all believers to be trained, mobilized, to live on mission. That's what we're all about. Right, Ed? Amen. How many times does the board remind you of that? <laughs> that, that is our vision. Our and anything that is not helping us to become that, you just, that's not our role then. You've got to cut it out. You've got to be focused. Singleness of mind and purpose. You've got to be focused on that vision. That's what we are. Underneath that, so I use this because... If you guys are in youth ministry, you have a church vision, whatever that is, but then there's youth ministry. I use National Institute TK as an example of a statement underneath the broader one to impact the church by equipping students to influence positively the lives of the next generation of leaders. And that fits underneath what the CE National vision is. The two have to be aligned. You can't have separate visions or you'll have problems. You have to have a vision overall that typically is going to be set in a church organization by an elder board or the pastor or direction of where you're going. The youth area is set and saying, okay, here's where we want to go. And it is subservient to that overall vision. And it gives you purpose. In fact, at our church where I go, I attend uh, Grace Church in Akron. Uh, they have in the lobby, they have hanging 13 things. It's too many for me to remember, right? They got 13 purposes, but we got three simple ones. Know it, live it, give it away. Everything our church does is around those three things. Know it, live it, give it away. Like I said, we got hanging in the uh, lobby. You go to our church building. There's 13 things on there, nice written sentences. I can't remember, but man, most people, and, and, and our, our pastors do a great job from the pulpit. Everything we talk about is know it, live it, give it away. right? And that's the vision. That's what drives our church and drives the body to move in that direction. So vision, first key. What's the vision? Second one is culture. What culture? Culture is the deeply seated norms, values, behaviors that team members share. So you create a culture. I can tell you, if I went to your church and I spent a little time, there would be a culture there that I would tell you. Perfect, thanks. There would be a culture there that we would be able to identify. What I use, and these are just examples of core values because these are mine over the years that I've come up with, is... Five things. Safety, integrity, teamwork, draft results, customer focus. Those are the core values that I live by and I drive throughout any organization I'm at. And as I was telling Ed one time, actually, if we had more time, actually all those are rooted in Scripture. Safety, integrity, teamwork, draft results, all have Scripture for me implications. One thing in the business world, I try to have God talk, but because of my role in the business world, being in the public sector, sometimes I have to be careful, but behind everything I do has a biblical meaning. In fact, I told Ed one time, I had a conversation with one of my top guys because he asked me, he asked me about these core values, where they came from. God opened the door to tell me, oh, here's where they come from. We'll do that. Next one, I'll just use an example. Integrity. 
What I like about integrity is the bottom right corner there. Integrity is where the intersection of what we believe, your words, and your actions. That's your integrity. Because a lot of people can say certain things. It doesn't really matter what you say. It's the words you use then and the actions. Integrity is that central hub where all that intersects on who you are. And in our world as believers, right, we should live above the standard of what anybody calls. Even if, again, Paul talks about this, if it causes my brother, even though it may not be right, now this is where my legalism may come in, if it's not right for somebody and they see it, I am not going to do it. I'm going to live in a realm that is above reproach. And that may mean, and I won't name some of those great things out there, you have to decide for yourself, where do I position myself? And all I say is, if you want to be a person of true integrity, take a position and say, this is why I'm doing it, because Scripture says, I don't want to cause the bread to fall. And so I'm going to live above approach in everything I do in my life. Values, practice what you preach, stay true to, to your core values, integrity. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. C.S. Lewis. You guys know C.S. Lewis? I love this because that 1.5 million miles I got to fly in airplanes, guess what happened at the end of that every night? Where, where was I? Hotel room. Hotel room. Right? Oh, hotel room. Well, my wife sometimes be a thousand miles away, right? Very early, I told my wife, I'm, here, I'm going to set up so that, man, babe, you don't have to worry. I'm going to imagine you're with me every moment of my life. Right? It's going to have that above approach for her. Right? Everything we do. So, uh, and I read C.S. Lewis a lot when I was in college, and I love this quote. Even when no one's watching, that's how I should live my life. Because we know Jesus is watching at the end of the day. Okay. Teamwork. Teamwork. Teamwork coming together is the beginning. So a lot of times we get volunteers to come together. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Right? Getting everybody to march. And here's an example I use. We're in a, I want all of us to get into a canoe. And we're in a row out in that ocean. And we all get in a canoe and we start to row in the ocean. And if half of you are rowing backwards and half forward, what happens? We're together. We're together. After we do that for a while, some of you get really frustrated. And you say, I'm getting out of the canoe. Now we're not together anymore. If we stay together and we get everybody working together and rowing in the same direction, now we have some progress and success. And that's what you want to try to do in your ministry, right? And something where it gets difficult. We talk about accountability. Is man, I got to hold people accountable to row in the same direction. Because sometimes, here's what I've learned in the business world. I've never worked in ministry full time, other than through uh, my involvement. But sometimes you got to cut the shaft off. Sometimes you got to let someone go. My brother and sister, and they may be. And I, I, I've been in churches where we've had uh, splits, we've had issues, and sometimes you say, "My brother." We're not rowing in the same direction. It's okay. Maybe if you're going to go row some, somewhere else, that's fine. I love you. But it can't work because we'll be at tension. And then that tension starts to lead throughout the organization, throughout the body. Scripture talks about that, right? Cut off finger, hand, eye. That's what he's telling us is, man, in your organization, you need to be focused. And we're going singleness of mind together, working together. If not, we'll have some challenges. And here's, here's the hard thing what I had to learn. Because when you did that, the organization will fly because now everybody has a purpose. The one person went the other way, it'll be up to them. I've seen them fly because they're meant to go a different way. And I tell you, young in my career, when I had to fire people, when I had to do things that are uncomfortable, it was like I, I learned that, oh, it's for their good that they need to go. And you do it out of love and for their good. Okay. For example, I just gave Ed, I just had to shut down a plant with 113 people, right Ed? We're talking about this. And my prayer was, Lord, help us find the right place. But for the thousand people, it was the right thing to do. For 113 and their families, it wasn't. So, tough decisions, but working together as a team. I love no I in team. T-E-A-M-I. It's a quote we used to have in the locker room in baseball. Okay. Drive for results. Here's where we get to set the goals. Again, you got to be driven. Hold yourself to the excellence in everything you do every day. Right? Now, does that, does that mean my wife and I, if you ever met my wife, we're polar opposites. You know how God works? He puts people that are totally opposite together. I'm full of energy. I can do, she is slow, quiet. Uh, I can't force her to be like me, right? Her world of excellence is totally different than what I deem my world of excellence. But we have to understand each other's excellence. 
So for you, it may look totally different on how you're driven to achieve that excellence every day and what you do and how you show that. Highest level of performance, constantly changing to improve, proactive versus reactive, because here's what I tell you about change. If you let the world change around you, then you will be reacting to it at some point, because it's changing. Well, you want to be, and here's what a leader does, a leader is proactive looking. This is why you read books. This is why you come to events like this. This is why you take kids' momentum. You want to look out to the future and say, Lord, but where are things going that I need to adjust now to reach out to them? Because if I wait to get there, and they're there, now I'm just reacting to the problem. I wasn't proactive. So being proactive, and that's why setting goals, and goals is the hardest thing to set. Nobody likes to set a goal. Nobody likes to have your pastor come and say, hey, I want 50 baptisms this year. I can tell you in our church, we actually started putting goals on it. Um, not because, of, oh, that's the number one, but begin, so you have a vision of what you're working towards. That's what a goal does. It creates that vision. The process of working collaboratively within the group, right? So the teamwork is for one purpose, to achieve a goal. So if I don't have a goal, I may be working, but where am I going? Got to have a goal. And I'll give you an example of a goal. We, uh, I just did this last Sunday with the team with the young men I'm with. Goal setting, goals energize people. Not always. Specific, clear, challenging goals lead to greater effort and achievement than easy or vague goals. Here's what I tell the team, and you'll see at the end. Hey, if it's something I can see and I know how to do and I can get there, then guess what? It's no good. Right? That's just easy. You can just do it. It has to be something. I said, 50 baptisms? I have no idea how it's going to happen. We want 200 kids to go to Momentum? I don't know how it's going to happen. We want 250 kids to meet on a Sunday night in student life groups, and we need 50 people to volunteer for that? How are we going to do that? Right? So that's setting the goal. There has to be some realism to it, but not so easy you can achieve it. I call it SMART goals. Okay, SMART goals. SMART is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely. Goals are your guideposts along the road that make compelling vision come alive. I can tell you there's tons of research out there on goal setting, organization development, psychology of people, tons and tons of research, and according to that, goal setting is the single most powerful motivational tool in that toolkit for you as a leader. Believe it or not, it is. And it's not easy setting goals. In the business world, it's not easy. In ministry, where it's a little more touchy-feely, it can't be easy. Right? But you've got to challenge yourself to set those goals. They're the guideposts to make that vision come alive. Because a goal, then without a plan, is just a wish. You're just wishful thinking. That's all you're doing. Versus I set the goal, I try to work for it, I have a plan, I'm going to set up a series. So again, back to it, just using our church as an example. Baptism, we wanted to do it, guess what we started? Splash Bash. Two times a year we do a big event, Splash Bash. Once in the summer, once inside. This last year we had over 75 kids baptized. Right? So we had a plan, right? Hey, you want to baptize? It just isn't to baptize them. It's why? Because of what that means in their walk and where they're going. Let's have an event. Now, again, I, I tell you this. Uh, does that mean every kid understood exactly what they're doing on that day? Probably not. But does that matter? Because I'll use an example of my own life, right? I baptized my daughter in our church in Tennessee. She was in second grade. Daddy, Dad, I want to be baptized. She got baptized. She said all the right things. But Emma, this is Emma, one daughter. It was actually at our church in Akron where she said, nah, I really understand. I want to get baptized again. That's okay. Again, maybe theologically some people may disagree with me, but I, I think, man, put them on that path. Because why? What's the world doing? Oh, don't get me started what the world does. The world puts them down a path of trying to convince them and believe in some. Why can't we get them on the right path? Okay? Customer focus. Again, Customers, all you do in your world, all you do is, man, teens and young adults. That's your focus, right? That's your ministry. That's who you're serving. You got some competitive, in the business world, we call it competitive influences. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, neighbors, the culture at large. You have a competitive, competitive environment. In the business world, that's what we look at. We look at, man, what's the competitive environment? What are they doing to prevent us from being successful? So in ministry, it's simply, man, I, I want to reach the youth. How am I going to reach the youth? Well, to reach them... I got to be able to also reach parents, uncles, grandparents, friends, families. I got to look around that whole environment because, man, what's Satan? Satan is a roaring lion. He's coming after us, coming after those kids. So we got to plan. You don't think he plans out his attack? We need to plan it with him. That's your customer. 
Accountability. I'm probably going to go over. How many? We're done, right? So five more minutes. Bear with me. Because accountability is key to making all this work. Accountability, the glue that holds vision and culture together. I can create all this, and then if I don't hold myself and the people I work with accountable, then it doesn't matter. It gets destroyed. And that accountability is difficult, difficult, difficult times as a leader. Because it may be your best friend. It may be your best friend is doing something that you know is not biblical, is not living it out. It may be, if my wife was here, she'd tell you, sometimes it may be within the marriage they need accountability. And say, man, what's going on? That's not easy, right? So accountability is not easy. But man, it is important that we take responsibility as a leader. It's the climate, the mood, the unique personality of an organization, which includes attitudes, beliefs, and influence that create a collective behavior. So example, sports is a great medium to show these things. My beloved Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> My beloved accountability. They, this year, the team, the culture, the vision, the accountability has been lacking. I, you just see it, right? The players, how they play, what they're doing, a lot of issues. Where the prior year, pretty much the same group of guys, a few changes. It, it, it was a different feel. Just a, a feel, and you can't, this is one on, on accountability, and call, you can't like point to it, you, you just feel it, right? How many have been on a winning whatever? You've been a part of something winning, right? Isn't that an amazing feeling? You, you feel the team, you would die for each other. You're doing it for each other. Other things you've probably been a part of, you're like, oh man, why am I here tonight, right? <laughs> what am I doing? Why am I part of this? That's that whole, and that's that accountability, and accountability drives the organization to see that. And it's not easy. <sighs> Here's the accountability ladder I use. On which side of the line do you fall? There's two sides. There's victim behaviors, accountability behaviors. On the bottom side, have you heard this? And this could be either they're unaware or unconscious of it, or they could have a passive-aggressive nature. You can study psychology. There's a lot of ways people exhibit this. But basically, they blame others, they make excuses, I can't, or they wait and hope. Hey, how come you didn't come to our, our volunteer? We had this thing, oh, I don't know, I got tied up over here. And so the answer is, you know what, I, I just didn't make the commitment to come. That's okay. Because you want people to start talking truth. And truth's okay. As a leader, you're not going to get on them. You shouldn't. If they're talking truth, you should get on them. They say, well, I blame someone else. Because you're trying to get to their heart at the end of the day. The volunteer, you're trying to reach into their heart to help them see who they are and where they need to be. And so a lot of times, again, wait and hope. I can't. Uh, personal response. At dinner, we are talking about it. Um, it's not by chance that I took 45, 50 kids down to Urban Hope uh, every summer for nine years. Right? It was because why? I go to people, hey, you going to Urban Hope in the summer? Why aren't you coming with me? You going to come? Are you going to come? Or are you thinking about it? I think you're thinking about it. Are you in? Are you in? Are you there? <laughs> See? And, and sometimes I have kids look at me and say, uh, I'm not sure. You're not sure? Well, think about it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll talk to you next week. I'll talk to you about it. Well, you can't be afraid to ask people to do something in leadership, right? Because why? You have to be so passionate about it. If, if you're not asking, then I, I raise the question, well, I'm not passionate about it, right? Hey, do you want to go to South Africa with me? I really don't want to go. Yeah, I really don't want to go either. <laughs> That's the difference, right? If, you're not, if volunteers get asked to do something they're not passionate about, guess how they're going to approach it? Just like that. You have a passion for it, and then you can't be afraid to ask people. On the top side, hey, acknowledge reality. Embrace it. Find solutions. Make it happen. That's the accountability side behavior you want when you work with people. Okay, here's the thing about people. Did I tell you too? One thing I did, I taught for five years uh, at college, uh, finance and managerial accounting. And in that five years, I learned a lot about the bell curve of people. What I learned and all those things we learned in school, there's a bell curve of people. Man, it's real. Because I used to think I'm the doggone best teacher around. Remember I told you I'm pretty self-confident? So I don't know, I didn't understand why everybody in my class didn't get an A. Because they got the best teacher in the world. Man, I worked so hard at, man, everybody's going to get an A. And every time I do it, there'd be a bell curve. Some people had A's, B's, C's, D's, and some of you fell. And it was the same material consistently for five years that I taught. And what I learned about people is the way God designed it. And actually, I had a, a PhD HR guy that worked with me, and he did a PhD program, did it biblically. And actually, he called me and said, This is from the Bible. There's four types of people God created sharks, 
You guys know sharks? You think about the sharks? There's crabs. <laughs> there's whales and there's dolphins. There's four type of people out there and they fit into that bell curve where there's 10% 10, 10 of the people that are going to be driven and very passionate about what they do. What classification do you think I'm in? Sharks. <laughs> right. I'm a shark. I, I admit it, man. I'm a shark and I'm driven and, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. Again, sharks can be bad if they don't channel the energy right or it could be good. Hey, then there's a group of people, that next group, that kind of are pretty good and that's the dolphins. Man, they're fun to be around. Yeah, they're fun to be around. They're cool and, and they're kind of there. They're kind of there all the time. They're hanging around. Then there's the whales. The whales are just ones that are, man, they're great people too. And they're there, but they're not quite there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then there's the crabs. They will rebel against everything you do. No matter what you say or how, they look the other way. Their glass is half empty. Four types of people, and that curve is pretty good in personality types. That's not in grading, but just in personalizing how they approach it. And so I learned about people. What I had to learn is, hey, I need, because I used to be under the mode of, I didn't want anybody like me. All the sharks I had to get rid of, right? I just want a bunch of dolphins and whales around me. And it wasn't good. I needed some more sharks to counteract me, and I needed a bunch of dolphins and whales. And with the crabs, could I get rid of all the crabs? You can't. As hard as you try and get rid of the crabs, you can't get rid of them. They're going to be around. They're going to complain. They're going to gripe. They're going to be the world's half empty. But here's what you got to do if I'm always looking at it. On a continuum of, of attitude and performance, you look at where that bell curve is and where your team is and where your organization is, and your goal is to say, I'm going to move it all the way to the end. I'm going to raise the level, and we're going to move this way. And so, man, my sharks are really sharks, and they're driving. My dolphins are doing great, and even my crabs, they moved, but they're still crabs, they're complaining. <laughs> right? They're going to be there, but their crabbiness is a little less of complaining and going in their direction. Right? That's your challenge in leadership, is how do I move all along? How do I move my kids along there? And that's that accountability ladder. Okay? Difference between a leader and a manager. In an organization, there are two sides of leadership. There's the quantitative part, or the hard part, which is process, policy, procedures, measurements, KPI, structure. You guys all have within your organization, your church, some sort of structure, right? Some sort of policy. It could be a little loose, depending on what organization and how your pastor leads it, the organization. Um, if you're an organization with me, man, it's not loose at all. Policies and procedures clearly define. We measure. This is the way it is because that's how we get excellence. It'll vary, but that's the way it should be. That's the easy, tangible stuff. Easy to measure the impact. It's command and control. That's a manager. I just command and control it. I muscle my way through it. The soft part or the qualitative is the, that's the values, the cultures, the ideas, the fears, excitement, resistance, attitudes. It's intangible. It's hard to measure its impact. When it's good, you know it's good. When it's bad, you know it's good. Right? But it's, it's tough to say here's why. Buy-in of the people who do the hard part is what you're trying to do, and that's a leader. In fact, when I tell people as a leader, you know what you want to do? You want to get somebody to do what you want to do, and they think it's their idea. And that's not manipulation. That's leadership. Leadership is saying, here's where I want to go, and I want them to kind of work through it and process and get there, and hey, it's their idea, and they get there. That's what a leader will do. A leader will help people see that and get back. Okay? What's key performance indicator. What we measure is uh, the key performance indicator of the organization. Again, a KPI would be how many salvations, how many baptisms do you have, uh, how many programs are you running, how many, again, fun nights are we going to have playing games, or just KPI. I meant measuring them. They all have a purpose at the end of the day, but it's an event to create the end purpose, which is to get people in a relationship, to get people talking, to try to meet the need, to help them see who Jesus is. And there's, there, again, different things in that structure, right? Sometimes there's teaching. Sometimes there's fun and game, relationship. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but it's things you measure. Ah. Which is more important, a leader or a manager? Management is getting people to do what needs to be done. A manager pushes. A manager's command. I bet a lot of you guys are acting like managers now. Just, that's the easy one. Because I can control it. I can do it. I can go. Oh, I picked on her last time. Pick on you. Hey, can you go get me a drink of water? Really, I need a drink of water. My throat's... Can I get a drink of water? 
Can, I give, can you give me a drink of water, really, please? See, if I kept pushing her for a little bit, she eventually gave me a drink of water. Even though she asked me, please, she had the right response. Because either, here's the thing, it will, conflict, it would, it would have gotten into a conflict, right? As I kept pushing. And that's usually what happens to the manager, right? Either a person on the other side is compliant and would have said, okay, I'll go get it. Or she's like, no, say please. And that was the right response, by the way. Yeah. Hey, please, oh, yeah, right. Please, please, please go get me water. Then she made because now we have a different, and that's what a leader, he recognizes the challenge and the direction I need to change it to get to the heart of what would drive her to go get me a glass of water at the end of the day. If I don't, if I just keep plowing ahead, a manager, I, you guys have seen this, where I'm going to keep pushing, I'm going to try to control, I'm going to try to direct it, I'm, my will is going to outwill her, and eventually if you're strong enough and you're a shark, I'll get her to do it. Well, not now because I said it, now she won't want to do it. <laughs> Leadership, getting people to want to do what needs to be done. Leaders pull people along. Leaders communicate to people. We sit and talk about what we're trying to do. Okay, that's what, that's what the senior pastor does from the pulpit on a Sunday. He's there leading, pulling, he should be. He shouldn't be pushing them. He should be pulling them to see where they need to go in whatever series he's talking about. I want to pull you along. I want to communicate effectively, so I'm pulling you. Because... In just my view, and I've been in many, many churches in my life, if all the person's doing is just you're pushing, 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 people will just show up and that's it. You want, you want them to catch the vision and see it. Okay. Here's the key about it. You have to strike a balance. Sometimes you need to be a leader. Sometimes you do need to be managed. Right? So there is no one is greater than the other. You need to balance it and understand what management is, what leadership is, and what do I need to do in this situation. Okay? Uh, ultimately, you need to find a balance between the two. Okay. Here's the mistakes I've learned over the years. Really big mistakes. One thing is certain in life, you and I will make mistakes. The question is, will we choose to learn from it? Right? When I was your age, sitting in a room and listening to this, I probably would have been the arrogant guy saying, oh, I got this figured out. Right? I got this figured out. But, made a lot of mistakes along the way. <clears throat> Here they are. Here's, this is my experience. Five fatal mistakes. Failure to set proper expectation and clear goals. Number one. Number one in my experience over my 30 year career in the business world um, and even in ministry that I've been involved in, when we don't set clear goals, proper expectations, man, everybody gets out of kilter. Right? So setting clear expectations for volunteers. In fact, here's one thing we started at our church on that Sunday night when we meet. We had the leaders. We used to just, leaders come, teach their kids. We had no communication with the leaders. So guess what happened? We, we kind of had some conflicts of people doing their own thing out here. We started to have everybody come in 30 minutes early and we meet as a leadership group. And in that leadership group for 30 minutes, we did 15 minutes talking about what we're doing, where we are, problems, and then obviously praying for it. Man, that made it so much better. Taking 30 extra minutes just again to what? Set expectations and have a clear goal of what we're trying to do. And, which, and, and Todd, Todd, who is our uh, shoemaker, who's our youth pastor, he started talking about why we're here as leaders, right? And setting expectations for that group uh, in there. Uh, another thing we started to do, because an example for you on good communication, we actually started meeting a small group with Todd to go over how's the group. So example, some guys in my group at first, there's three other guys that helped me, 23 guys. I said, hey, let's put them up on the wall and let's rank them from one to 10. One being, man, we know they're not walking at all, right? Five, yep, we know they've accepted the Lord. They know who Jesus is. Ten is man, they're, they're running. A couple guys, oh, we can't rank people. I said, no, it's not about them, it's about us. How do we see where they are? So we went through, and after we went through, after we're all done, guess what everyone in the room said? Wow, what an amazing exercise. Because we went through, some guys were not even, they were unknown. As a leader, when you said, man, they're on, I don't know where they are spiritually. They're on the roster, and I don't see them, they're unknown, man. We should trip like their soul is at stake. They're unknown, guys. How do we, what do we do? So then we set a plan on how we're going to communicate with them. How are we going to go after them? Now, does that guarantee they're going to show up any more Sundays? No. But, okay, at least we've done what we can to go after them. Hey, some were, some, amazing, right? We went through the group. Some were actually threes and fours. We knew spiritually they weren't there. Okay, what's our plan to go after them? Oh, their parents are great parents. They're here every Sunday. The kid shows up all the time, but spiritually he's not there. Okay, that's, that's not, how do we partner with the parent? How do we have, oh, what's happening in the home life? This is the advantage of being with them from 7th grade to 11th grade. You know a lot of what's happening in their lives. 
and how you walk through it. Sometimes it's difficult, right? Some kids were at seven, eight, and then we identified, because we're passionate about our youth, we identified who's the future youth pastors of the world, right? We identified four guys on the list and said, man, let's, let's tap them on the shoulder and say, here's what I see in you, because here's the thing, Joel Hawthorne, Howard Magnello, Cliff Lytle, Pam and Art Cooper, Barb and Mark Mitten. Guess who those people are? People who influenced my life when they were teaching me in 5th grade, 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. People who dedicated their life to changing me. Did they, did they know someday that, oh my goodness, Joel Hawthorne, that skinny little kid who didn't say much, someday was going to be a leader at two public companies. Right? But they poured into my life. That's what we want to do, right? Tap on the shoulder. In fact, it was actually uh, not a spiritual thing, but also encouragement. I had a, and through athletics, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you're pretty good at what you do. That goes a long way, doesn't it? When you're thirsty, when God created to hear, hey, I'm hungry for something, and you tell them, encourage them. Okay? Failure to communicate clearly and consistently. Sit dog, sit dog, sit dog, sit dog, sit, sit dog, sit dog. Man, you got to keep communicating, communicating. Even when you, I said, real thumb is when someone finally says to me, okay, I got it. <laughs> I'll go get your water. <laughs> I got it. Then that, okay, I got I to gotta back off a little bit. Maintain a top down attitude, meaning if you position yourself as I'm the leader and it's all top down, nobody's going to want to be with you. Man, in scripture, right? We're servant leaders. Right? It's a bottom up. It's just that I've seen mistakes where, man, and even when I thought I was right and I pushed it down, it was wrong. Okay? Putting paperwork before people work. Again, what that means is it is about people. Even in the business world. Right? It's about people. And what am I doing to encourage more of those people? And the big last one, not holding people accountable. And this is one I've added in the last five years in my career that, man, I, I see where not holding the organization accountable causes more damage than that tough decision and tough conversation you're going to have with somebody. Okay, a couple things. You can see it. How do you know you become a true leader? One, you don't try to be right. You try to be clear. Two, you try not to have the last word. Three, you no longer try to show that it was your idea. You empower other people to own the idea. That's how you know you become a leader. Right? Early on, you asked my wife if she was here. Oh, I, I would always win every battle, right? I'd have the last word. It would, I would be right. I mean, I had to learn that's not the right approach. And again, I did it in a nice way. Right? There's other people out there you know that, oh, they're just dictators, right? Okay. Mistake leaders make, not holding people accountable, be a leader. Hold yourself accountable, the rest take care of yourself. Three types of leaders in the New Testament, right? What I said earlier, prophet, priest, king. Leadership style, and actually in the business world, they call them different words, words but it's there. A prophet is one that ha is, is naturally has the vision and has that foresight, and they just lead people there. Some of you in there may have that. If it's not your gifting, it's okay. Because there's the, what's the next one? Prophet, priest. Priest is the shepherd. The shepherd is the one, oh, the one that can, sometimes can't do what I, I can't do, it right? Can love on anybody, right? That's that shepherd. That's that priest. And that's leadership sometimes is that. Then there's the king. The king is the authoritative one. The king is the one that is the manager. Some of us are bent towards being just a king and managing things. And I've seen people work with that. In leadership, what you want to do is one of those is kind of your strength, but you want to understand all three and try to work on them. And try to understand it. And then surround yourself with people that kind of complement who you are. And understanding that. And it's okay because why? We're all gifted differently. Okay? Be a leader. Hold yourself accountable. Okay. Last three. What does this mean? What's the win? How are we successful? We've talked about a lot of things, right? Volunteers, building blocks, who you are, excellence, accountability, vision, manager, leaders. Here's three things I'll give you to ponder. All right? Three things. One. Do you believe what appears to be impossible is possible? Especially as a believer, a child of the one true king, do we truly believe what appears to be impossible is possible? I, even in, in our Christian faith sometimes, we limit. God's up there saying, man, my child, you can do this. Trust me. 
Trust me. It's okay. And that doesn't mean sometimes in that trust, it's taking a scary step that you can't see. Because again, misnomer right out there, is the Christian life supposed to be cozy and easy? Right? No. It's tough. In fact, you, it, it's a tough walk. So, do you believe the impossible? And it starts with your state of mind. What's your state of mind? Okay? Two, let your faith be bigger than your, bigger than your fears. Let your faith be bigger than your fears. A lot of times we stop doing things, and especially as a leader, you're afraid. You're, well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Am I a leader? Am I not a leader? Well, I'm, a, I'm afraid. Well, no, I'm going to take a step of faith out of here, Lord. Right? And that goes to all the other things that you're talking about throughout this. You've got to be in the Word. You've got to be in worship. You've got to be in community. All those things. Like, you can't do these in a void, right? All that's going, no, hey, okay, Lord, I, I'm going to take the step of faith. Right? I'm not going to live by fear. Celebrate the wins, achievements, and victories. Learn from your losses, mistakes, and defeats. Okay? That's what a le leader does, too, is recognize sometimes I'm wrong. And let's let the person know that. Okay? Last one. Do things for people not because of who they are or what they do in return, but because of who you are. Let your actions support your faith, your hope, your love. Know who you are in Christ. My life verse is 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, when I say 1 Corinthians 13, what do you all think about? Verses 1 through 10, right? Love. And you think of verse 1 through 10? And all Paul's, this is my opinion, I'm not a pastor, but all Paul's setting up there is talking about love. He's saying, look, this is what it looks like because when he gets to 11 through 13, he says, man, I was, I was a child. I'm just a child. And, man, what I see dimly lit in the mirror, someday I'll fully understand. I don't understand why there's homeless. I don't understand why there's addiction. I don't understand in the church why people fight over the silliest things. I don't understand it. But, okay, you tell me. Paul says, man, hey, faith, hope, and love. Faith's the foundation. The foundation of who you are and what you believe. Hope is what? That, uh, that hope and an eternity that we can go to and be complete. This world won't be broken anymore. But man, till then, he says, till then, what am I going to do? Love. And why? What is love? It is the action. Right? It is the action that says, I'm going to get messy. It's going to get dirty. I'm going to pour into people's life. And when I do that, people are going to hurt me back. Right, Ed? People are going to hurt me. But that's okay because why? I'm a child of God. I'm reaching out. I'm going to love. That's my life verse because, again, there's a lot of things I understand in life. A lot of things that aren't clear why they happen, when they happen, right? And every one of us could go around and think about that. Man, I don't understand. There's some things that happen. But he says, someday we'll know. I hang on. That. Someday it will be clear. And as I said, someday I'll be lined up behind you because of what you guys are doing for the youth. You'll see. There's that one song. I can't remember who sings it now. But I love it. She says, I see the line a mile long of all the people I impacted on this side of heaven that are there. I personally, that's the vision I see, right? Is someday we'll be able to see, and it may be a small conversation, it may be a deep conversation, it may just be a hug, but the impact we're going to have, because know who you are in Christ and why you do what you do. Okay? All right. Sorry I went over. Thanks.